Hello, welcome to our webinar, Nonprofit Risk Management in the Me Too Era, hosted by the Nonprofit Alliance. I'm Shannon McCracken, CEO of the Alliance, and I'm pleased today to welcome Lisa Bronner, who is the Head of Employment Law Practice with Perlman and Perlman. Um, among the, the many um, things that Lisa does and, and um, responsibilities that she covers for, for her firm, she conducts trainings like this one on preventing unlawful discrimination, harassment, um, and works with both nonprofits and corporate partners. So Lisa, we really appreciate having you here today. Before I turn this over to you, just a couple quick housekeeping things. First of all, we are recording this webinar and we will make the recording available to you as attendees as well as to others. Um, and Lisa is planning to leave time at the end for Q&A. So um, please use your chat box to submit those questions. We will make sure that we catch up on those at the end, um, either within the webinar or, um, or in individual follow-up if needed. There is a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to, to cut other comments short, Lisa, and just turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Shannon, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about turning hashtag me too into hashtag not, not here. Uh, and just a disclaimer at the beginning that the webinar is really for general information and is not to be construed as legal advice. Uh, really what we're gonna be talking about today is, this is not a, a, a training on preventing sexual harassment in the workplace, but really is more of a, of a focused discussion about uh, what the, ki the kinds of things nonprofits can do to minimize the risk of these types of claims, sexual harassment claims in the workplace. And we're gonna be touching on a few areas, which are what is the board's role and responsibility? Uh, sometimes nonprofits are not really, they're thinking about uh, just what are the responsibilities of the supervisors within their organization, but haven't really taken the time to focus on what is the board's role here? What is the responsibility of human resources? And how do volunteers factor into this? Have you thought about volunteers and the issue of sexual harassment and how you're gonna address it? And does your organization have a risk management plan in place before a crisis occurs. Uh, and then also, what is the plan? Have they thought about what the plan is to respond in the event of a, of a crisis? And finally, what are some uh, best practices around workplace policies and procedures? So a couple of years ago, Time and SurveyMonkey did an online poll in response to the hashtag MeToo movement that had come about where they surveyed American adults and 82% of the people who responded said women are more likely to speak out now about sexual harassment since the allegations against Harvey Weinstein came to light. They also said that the majority believe women making allegations of sexual harassment, which may not have been the case in the past. And 67% said that they believe that sexual harassment is a large problem today in America. And as we know, nonprofits, and the reason why we're having this program, are not immune from sexual harassment. We've seen flashed across the headlines in various nonprofit publications, uh, stories of sexual harassment at organizations, whether it's been conducted by CEOs of of, of large, well-known nonprofit organizations or donors or board members, the topic has been in the news uh, with respect to nonprofits. And so it's really been an opportunity for nonprofits over the last few years to really take a hard look at what's happening in their organizations and whether their organizations are equipped to be able to prevent these types of claims and to address them. So we've also read in the news about some tone deaf statements by nonprofit board members concerning allegations of sexual harassment that have been brought against their leaders. And really what I, what I say uh, when I am doing trainings for, 
for clients, for nonprofit organizations, is that it's really about the tone from the top. And when I talk about the tone from the top, I mean not just the tone that's set by the CEO or executive director, but the tone that's even set at the board level. And are board members essentially on board with what the organization's policies are? And are those policies aligned with what the mission of the organization is? So it's really important that board members uh, understand what the law is, what the law prohibits, the type of behavior that is impermissible in the workplace, that is prohibited by the law, and that the board members are uh, ensuring that the organization is complying with those and not either ignoring misconduct or looking the other way. We also know that perhaps unique to, to nonprofits is the issue of uh, sexual harassment and donors. Uh, we know that sexual harassment is pervasive in fundraising uh, because there was a, a survey that was done a couple of years put out by the Association of Fundraising Professionals and the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and it was conducted by uh, Harris Poll. And they found in this poll that there is, uh, that there is rampant sexual harassment uh, in the area of fundraising at nonprofit organizations, and that in the survey that they did, 65% of the um, cases were instances where the harasser was a donor. Um, respondents to the survey said that they, they view sexual harassment as being pervasive in the fundraising area because young women are increasingly hired to ask older and wealthier men for money, that charity leaders may be exploiting these, uh, the women's appeal in order to raise money, and one fundraiser in the field for around two decades recalled being told that a candidate for fundraising opening, quote, may not be, a good, may not be good looking enough for the job. And so there were stories and anecdotes that, the, uh, that came about uh, in the course of this survey where they found that there were, that this was a real problem at nonprofit organizations, specifically in the area of fundraising where donors uh, were sexually harassing the fundraising professional, the fundraising employees. Um, and so some of the things that came from Inside Philanthropy, which had uh, published an article about sexual harassment being something that's really common in the fundraising world, were quotes from various fundraisers who talked about things like a donor suggested he'd give me more money if I had sex with him, took another board member raising a stink for my bosses to take it seriously. All they cared about was the bottom line. And when you have those, when an organization has those views that its employees are expendable, but its donors aren't, that type of view may foster an environment where an em employer is willing to allow the sexual harassment of its employees. But the law requires every employer needs to provide a safe workplace for their employee and that sexual harassment is unlawful. The other thing that came to light is, you know, that after a, after a, a revelation of sexual harassment at an organization, donors have pulled back their money and said, I'm not going to give to an organization um, where that money is simply going to be going to pay off a sexual harassment lawsuit rather than where I wanted that money to go, which is to the mission of the organization, because the organization hasn't taken care of protecting its employees. Um, and donors have said, I'm not going to give to that organization anymore if they're, they're, you know, they're using their money, they're not protecting their employees from sexual harassment. The mission is not aligned with the way in which they treat their employees. 
and the money that I'm giving, that I'm donating, I want to go to the mission of the organization. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So is your nonprofit organization vulnerable to a claim of sexual harassment? From the period of 1995 to 2016, over a thousand sexual harassment claims were filed against nonprofit employers. Most of those claims were filed by women. Uh, in the survey that I mentioned before, that was done of fundraisers where they interviewed a thousand fundraisers in the United States. 96% uh, of the cases involved, uh, the, the harasser was, was a man in those instances. So, as I said earlier, sexual harassment is unlawful. It's unlawful under federal law, under state law, and under local laws. Uh, although the standards for sexual harassment under the state and local laws uh, may, may differ from the federal law, it's still unlawful uh, at, un, un, under federal law, state law, and, and local laws. And it's unlawful regardless of who is engaging in the sexual harassment. As I was saying, a donor who's not an employee can, can uh, engage in sexual harassment and a nonprofit organization can be liable for sexual harassment committed against its employees regardless of who is doing the sexual harassment, whether it's a, a donor, a board member, another non-employee, a program participant, or of course, an employee. Uh, and as I said, employers are responsible, legally responsible, to keep their employees uh, safe and uh, in a workplace that's free of discrimination and harassment. And also, employers are have a legal responsibility to keep their employees free from retaliation, which is some type of action that's taken against someone because they complained of sexual or other unlawful harassment. So just to kind of give an overview, it's sexual harassment is defined as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature, or it could be of a non-sexual nature, but gender-based in nature. It's derogatory or disparaging to uh, someone because of their gender. When submission to the conduct is made either explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of the person's employment, Submission to a rejection of the conduct by an individual is used as a basis for an employment decision affecting the individual, and the conduct has a purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with the employee's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Harassment, there can be other types of harassment that are also unlawful that are not sexual harassment. If there is a legally protected category, uh, race, national origin, et cetera, other than gender, and uh, federal, state, and local laws also prohibit discrimination based on certain legally protected categories. So let's get back to the role of the board. Going back to the role of the board, the mission of the organization should be aligned with the treatment of staff. Is what the organization doing how they are helping in some way, whatever the cause may be, is it aligned with the way in which they are treating their staff? And if there's a disconnect, a donor may recognize that and say, I don't really, I don't really want to support an organization that says they're doing one thing and yet allow their employees to be sexually harassed, sexually abused, or assaulted. The board is responsible for the conduct of the CEO and the work environment. So they are responsible to know that the CEO is doing his or her job and is keeping the workplace safe from sexual and other harassment. And the board should be aware of the organization's policy prohibiting sexual and other unlawful harassment. So I do training not just for employees and managers, but I also do training for boards on their role and how they can prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, ensure that they're aware of what the organization's policy is about that, that the organization has a policy and what the complaint process is, and that boards should have and agree to themselves 
a code of conduct or a code of ethics for themselves. The organization says to its board members, here's, here's our code of ethics, and we expect you as a board member are going to abide by that. So training board members is really an important tool towards minimizing the risk of claims, because if the board is aware of what the organization's practices are, then they you know, can make inquiries into how is that policy being enforced? Have there been complaints? Have there been resolutions? What's happened? Have these cases been settled? Well, how much money have they been settled for? What have we done to ensure it doesn't happen again? So really goes to uh, the governance of the organization and making sure that, that things are being done in the way that they should to protect the, to protect the, um, the mission of the organization and to ensure that the employees feel safe in the workplace. So the board, what happens if the board gets a complaint of sexual harassment? Does the board know how they're going to handle it? If, and if an employee brings an anonymous complaint, or maybe not even an anonymous complaint, up to a board member regarding the CEO's conduct, or the executive director's conduct, how is the board going to handle it? Does the organization have a mechanism and procedure in place for the board to handle complaints if the complaints are about the CEO, let's say. Uh, and what's the process that the organization has for addressing misconduct by board members? We've heard of, of cases in which the board member is the one who is accused of sexually harassing a staff member or somebody in an annual gala engaging in inappropriate conduct. The organization needs to look at how are we, are we equipped to address this? Have we put in place procedures and protocols on how to, uh, how to address the situation where a board member is accused of sexual harassment? And also, has our board been trained to know what types of behavior we prohibit? at our organization, what type of treatment we expect the board members to exhibit when they are interacting with our staff or our program participants or our volunteers? And has the organization considered whether they have insurance coverage with respect to conduct engaged in by a board member? The organization may want to consider how the complaint that's brought to a the board's attention will be investigated. Will human resources investigate it? Ideally, to have an outside third-party investigator uh, is the preferable way to go than to have somebody handling it internally because you have someone who is objective on the outside looking in, then the, uh, you want to be able to have an objective report presented with respect to an internal issue that may be going on. And the board should consider what steps are going to be taken to assess how employees feel about how safe their workspace is. How does the board know whether employees feel safe in the workplace? Consider uh, what tools are they going to use? Are they going to do 360 degree reviews of the CEO or executive director to get feedback on how employees feel that the organization is being run and whether they feel safe there. Boards may want to consider whether they're going to do some type of background screening on potential board members to ensure that they don't have someone who is a serial harasser, has a history of uh, of engaging in sexual harassment has been accused of sexual harassment at other organizations uh, where the individual uh, is or was previously. And what is the sexual, does the organization have a sexual harassment prevention policy? And if so, is it an effective complaint mechanism? Does the board know whether complaints have been filed using that policy? How have they been resolved? And a good sexual harassment policy will have multiple avenues of complaint for an individual, that the individual has multiple ways in which they can 
they can complain, including that they can make a complaint to the board if, if they feel that the CEO, either the CEO is the person who engaged in the conduct or that the CEO is not addressing the conduct that's been raised. The policy should also address what the investigation process is and should be clear about what the consequences are for violating the sexual harassment prevention policy. It's very important that the board also knows that retaliation is unlawful and that retaliation is prohibited by the organization. So that employees feel safe coming forward reporting. One of the main reasons employees don't report sexual harassment is because they fear retaliation. They fear that if they do, something bad will happen to them. They'll lose their job or they'll suffer some other consequence for having complained about sexual harassment or for having participated in investigation. So it's very important that the organization takes a strong stance in not allowing retaliation or the threat of retaliation. And it's important that the board understands what the policy is prohibiting retaliation and uh, what's happened in the past. Has anyone claimed retaliation? How was the matter handled? How was it resolved? And that kind of thing. It's also important that the organization is reassuring the person who complained of sexual harassment that their complaint is being taken seriously and that they will not be retaliated against for having come forward to, to complain and that they should report any conduct that they think is retaliatory immediately to the CEO or executive director. Well, let's say that an organization is hit with the sexual harassment scandal and they need to think about beforehand, before any such conduct happens, I mean, part of it is putting protocols in place to ensure that it never happens, but in the event that it does happen, what is going to be our plan? How are we going to respond to this? Do we have a system in place for addressing crises like this? Do we have a public relations firm? How are we gonna go about doing donor outreach to reassure our donors uh, in the face of this terrible thing that's, that's happened? Uh, what is gonna be our outreach on social media to contain and manage this crisis? Uh, what is the organization doing to, to keep its finger on the pulse and to monitor the temperature in the environment, in the work environment? What are, what are people saying online on social media, on glass door reviews about what it's like to work at that organization? Is there something in those reviews that should be a red flag to the board, to either the CEO or to the board about the temperature at that organization, about the workplace at that organization and whether employees feel safe? And then what's the, what's the role with respect to volunteers? Well, volunteers are not employees. However, if you're running a program that has volunteers, it's a good idea that you, that you are letting volunteers know that this is the safe space for them to volunteer. And that you think about how are we gonna, what are the mechanisms we're gonna have for a volunteer to come forward if someone at our organization does something that makes that person feel uncomfortable? If that person feels that someone has touched them or said something to them, touched them inappropriately or said something to them inappropriately, you wanna have a mechanism for that person to bring the issue forward. Now that volunteer is not necessarily gonna have your employee handbook because they're not an employee, but the organization should be thinking about in their volunteer materials that they have a policy on how volunteers can air concerns, how they can come forward, who they should come forward to, how their matter will be, how their complaint or concern will be addressed, who will address it, and where they can go to raise that. And organizations need to be thinking about these things beyond the scope of just employees. In certain jurisdictions, like New York, for instance, independent contractors are also protected from being sexually harassed. And, um, and in certain jurisdictions, there have been claims of sexual harassment brought by volunteers. And volunteers, again, are not employees, but 
because they are doing because they are uh, doing something for your organization, it behooves organizations to think about if we have somebody doing work, doing something for our organization, we want to make sure that we have a mechanism for them to raise a concern with us. Make sure that you have volunteer agreements, that you've conducted uh, background checks too on your volunteers, depending on uh, depending on the situation, you don't want claims of um, sexual harassment made against made uh, by one of your employees against a volunteer. So there may be certain circumstances where you decide that it's appropriate to be uh, conducting um, criminal background checks, particularly uh, where you're dealing with vulnerable populations, children and the elderly, and other situations. Uh, that you may consider that it's appropriate to do that. And, and I would also suggest that in addition to having a protocol for your volunteers to raise complaints if somebody does something that makes them uncomfortable, that there's also, when you do training for your volunteers, that you also make them aware that there is a process, that you do have a mechanism for them to come forward. So, before we get to human resources, I did just want to mention one other thing. It's not about volunteers, but that organizations really need to think more broadly than the the uh, you know the four corners of their office when they think about keeping their employees safe. Many organizations send their employees to conferences, to different events that are outside the physical confines of the of the physical workplace and really need to think about, am I sending my, if I'm, if I'm hosting an event, are the folks that are attending my event, do they have a mechanism to come forward if something happens to them where they feel uncomfortable? This happens again and again, where clients call and say, we had an event and uh, somebody came up to us and said somebody uh, touched them inappropriately or made a, uh, you know, a comment of a sexual nature or something that was inappropriate. And it, it's, organizations really ought to be thinking about codes of conduct for their events. That they have attendees sign codes of conduct, acknowledging that they're going to abide by the code of conduct, that the organization expects certain behavior, that they expect respectful behavior at their conferences, and everybody who attends is agreeing, yes, I will abide by your code of conduct and your expectations that at your conference, I'm gonna behave in a certain way. Employers also need to be thinking about, if I'm sending my employee to an event for work, am I sending them to a safe space? Does the event that I'm sending to them to, does it have a code of conduct? Have I heard about instances of inappropriate conduct there? And is there a risk that my employee could be put at risk of something happening to them, of being sexually harassed? Um, what steps am I taking? So employers really need to think more broadly about events that they sponsor and events that they send their employees to and whether they are maintaining that safe space, both for their employees and for people who attend their events. Now let's turn to human resources. So the best practice is that an organization has a human resources person who is on site or who is readily accessible to employees on a daily basis. And that, that human resources person is, has a seat at the table, so to speak, has a direct reporting line to the CEO or executive director. That person really ought to be part of the leadership team who is Letting the CEO know, CEO know what the temperature is in the organization, how employees are feeling about things in terms of are they feeling safe and that type of thing. And what about organizations that say we're too small to hire a, a full-time human resources person, right? That, that, that's really the case uh, with smaller nonprofits. At a minimum, they should consider having some human resources presence even if it's in the form of, a, of a, a human resources consultant who is who is outside the organization, 
having somebody on a part-time basis, um, having an anonymous hotline where employees can report. You as an organization, you want your employees to come forward with complaints that they have. You want them to come forward with concerns. You want them to tell you about these things so that they can be addressed internally. If they don't have a voice, if they feel that they don't have a voice or a place to turn, then they turn to a lawyer or they turn to a government agency uh, to, to file a lawsuit. So boards have to hold their CEO accountable. And they have to comply with the law. They have to know what the law requires with respect to uh, sexual harassment, and they have to comply with it. And they have to make sure that the CEO is, is doing that and that the values of the organization are protecting the employees and keeping them safe. And that they have mechanisms in place that they're signing on to a code of ethics themselves or a code of conduct as to how they'll behave. And that the way in which employees and, pro and, and program participants and others involved in the organization are treated is aligned with what the values of the organization are. So how do you create accountability? Well, as I said, it's the tone from the top. So organizations have to hold people accountable where they engage in misconduct, where they engage in sexual harassment and not look the other way. That means the board members need to hold their CEO accountable and that no one is above the law. And organizations that follow that, that hold people accountable and say, we're not gonna allow this type of behavior in the workplace, have an environment where that type of behavior doesn't occur. Conversely, organizations that look the other way, that don't treat the matter seriously, or don't impose consequences, allow a, allow a toxic workplaces and workplaces that where sexual harassment occurs to, to permeate the workplace. As I mentioned, uh, one suggestion or thought is to screen your board members. And also, it, it's important that organizations recognize that values and ethics matter. So even if something doesn't rise to the level of being unlawful, being actual sexual harassment under the law, the organization doesn't need to tolerate conduct that makes its employees uncomfortable, uh, sexist remarks, sexist jokes and comments, comments that are derogatory, uh, let's say towards women because of, because of their gender. Uh, even if the conduct itself wouldn't rise to the level of being unlawful, if it's inappropriate conduct, organizations can take a stand and say, we just don't allow that type of behavior here and shouldn't allow bad behavior. And the organization really needs to uh, take human resources seriously as a partner at the organization uh, and, and trust it and employees need to to feel that they can trust human resources, that they can come with a complaint or a concern and that it will be addressed. Because if they don't feel safe bringing their concerns to the human resources department, then the organization is less likely to find out about when there really is a problem. And of course, regular training of supervisors and staff and board and the board on organization policies Prohibiting sexual harassment and retaliation is really crucial. In some jurisdictions, it's required annually. Uh, so ask yourself whether your employees trust that your organization is going to address the concerns. If they don't, you're more likely to have a sexual harassment claim. And do they? And likewise, if employees fear that they will be retaliated against. And retaliation, if it's happened at your organization, has not been addressed well or, the, or retaliation has occurred, then employees may feel less likely to come forward within the organization. And know, as a board, how are those who engage in inappropriate conduct, how are they held accountable? So the California treasurer, John Chang, had said, I thought was very uh, apt, if we want a more transformative and lasting answer, we must fundamentally change the power structure at the top of our institution.
institutions, the only way to change the status quo that leads people in power to think it's okay to grope, bully, and abuse is to change the power structure in corporate America by putting more women and minorities on boards of directors. And just as he was speaking about corporate America, the same is equally true for nonprofit organizations. But nonprofit organizations want to think about is there diversity at our organization, at the board level and the CEO level. A 2014 poll by the Chronicle of Philanthropy and George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Philanthropy and Fundraising said that in their poll, 66% of the people who responded said the organizations were primarily women, nonprofits, but the majority of the people who responded from large nonprofits said that their CEOs were male. And 69% of those surveys said the board was predominantly male. And 44% believed that the organization favored men over equally qualified women for leadership positions. So one way that organizations can create accountability is to recruit more women into leadership positions on boards and at the CEO level. We're going to talk about a few, some best practices to think about. Obviously. Every organization should have a policy that prohibits sexual harassment and retaliation. As I said, to have an, a complaint procedure that provides multiple avenues of complaint for the employee, consider implementing anonymous reporting line direct to the board. Think about also, as I mentioned, independent contractors in certain jurisdictions, they're also protected from sexual harassment. So when your organization engages with independent contractors, it should be thinking about what mechanisms do we have in place if an independent contractor had a claim of sexual harassment or had a complaint about uh, sexually harassing conduct? Do we have a mechanism to address it? Does our contractor, does our contract with the independent contractor address the process for them to uh, raise the complaint? and assign an outside investigator to investigate uh, complaints of sexual harassment, other unlawful harassment and retaliation. The investigation that's conducted should be a prompt thorough investigation and status and resolution of the complaint should be communicated to the complainant and the accused. It should be, the investigation process should be kept confidential to the extent possible. And the organization should impose consequences for violation of the policy to show that the policy has teeth, that it's not just, a, not just written on a piece of paper, but the policy actually will be enforced. And the organization should be thinking about, are they going to publicize the consequences to the staff? How are they going to handle the communication about the resolution of the matter? There should be regular training. And consider having a mandatory, a code of conduct for your board, for your volunteers, and for others who regularly interact with your employees that address the sexual harassment and retaliation and other types of unlawful harassment. Uh, consider that when you do onboarding for your board, that it includes the component of sexual harassment prevention and what your organization's mechanism is for boards to handle, receive and handle complaints about the CEO or other board members. And consider what the reporting mechanisms are going to be where the board member is accused of sexual misconduct or sexual harassment. If your organization is large enough, consider whether it makes sense to have either an ad hoc or permanent human resources committee. Uh, or inclusion of the human resources director on such a committee. Consider whether you want to do employee satisfaction surveys, surveys that address to employees how safe they feel in the workplace, whether they feel that their complaints that they surface are, are addressed by management. Uh, think, consider 360 reviews of C-level 
managers so that the board is getting feedback on how well the CEO is, is performing. As I mentioned, consider employee safety outside the workplace where you're either sponsoring an event or sending your employee to, uh, to an event for work outside the workplace. What steps are taken to ensure no sexual harassment on work assignments, codes of conduct for the attendees at, a, at an event that you are, that your organization is sponsoring, and for those who may be attending and, and or presenting. And consider how are you going to address sexual harassment by donors? We know it's an issue. And so what is the organization going to do? What is the plan? You cannot allow your employees to be sexually harassed by donors or anyone else. So how does the organization plan to prevent it from happening and how do they plan to address it? Um, <clears throat> consider that not only will you have a policy prohibiting sexual harassment, but you'll have a policy prohibiting supervisor subordinate relationships, policies prohibiting board members from getting romantically involved with staff or program and program participants. You have policies that address that type of behavior. Uh, as I mentioned, consider a code of conduct for events and complaint reporting mechanisms for those events and complaint reporting mechanisms for volunteers and agreement that they'll abide by a code of, code of conduct. We talked about background checks. And also uh, one last point about donors and vendors is considering about whether your agreements with them address concerns about potential misconduct. Whether you're going to, uh, and, and your ability to get out of those contracts based on something that the, a donor or a vendor does that would reflect or might reflect poorly on the organization. So what's at stake here? What are the consequences if you ignore sexual harassment at your organization? Well, first and foremost is, I shouldn't say foremost, but probably one of the first things that would come to mind is negative impact to your mission. A sexual harassment claim or the fact that sexual harassment is occurring is going to negatively impact the mission of your organization in multiple ways. First, it may cause irreparable damage to the reputa reputation or brand of your organization, and that is priceless. Reputation is it's, it's priceless, and that's something that's hard to get back once you've lost that. So in, organizations really need to be thinking about we want to protect our employees and have them feel safe. And in fact, we have a legal obligation to do that. And if you were to have a sexual harassment claim or claims, that could result in irreparable damage to your reputation. And think about the nonprofit organizations that you've heard about in the news that have had sexual harassment accusations and, and instances where there was, there was uh, ongoing behavior that was ignored by the board, uh, where either one or multiple employees were subjected to sexual harassment, and some of those organizations' reputations may not recover because of because of this negative publicity. Nobody wants to be on the front of the Chronicle of Philanthropy or in the Nonprofit Times because their organization was embroiled in sexual harassment, where its employees were sexually harassing other employees or its board members were sexually harassing employees. Loss of donations I talk about, talk, talked about before. Donors do not want to give to an organization uh, where its employees are engaging in sexual harassment and where the money that they're donating to go to the mission of the organization is instead being spent to resolve sexual harassment claim. Uh, organizations may be uh, subject to loss of a grant. They may not get a grant even if, they're, if, if someone in their organization is accused of sexual harassment, a loss of funding where there's sexual harassment. 
of course, legal liability uh, if there is sexual harassment. Uh, they'll be paying both the employee who was subjected to sexual harassment as well as the, the attorney's fees and potentially punitive damages. And as I said, that's money that is being directed to defending a lawsuit rather than directed to the mission. High employee turnover and loss of talent. Employees leave the organization because the workplace is toxic or they don't show up for work. You have higher absenteeism uh, because, uh, because of sexual harassment in the workplace and lost productivity. And I thought that this quote was, was apt from a GuideStar blog, a truly ethical organization can exist only when its leaders embrace ethical decision-making and recognize the importance of values other than the bottom line. And I just leave you with that, that quote as a reminder that it really is about the tone from the top at the organization. And if the organization sets the tone that they don't allow sexual harassment and that they will impose consequences for bad behavior, uh, that, that's a great start to ensuring that um, an organization is taking steps to help uh, minimize the risk of these types of claims. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and time, and I'm happy to take any comments or questions that you have at this point. Lisa, thank you so much. And the chat box is open for anyone to submit questions. Um, I, I do have one or two for you in the meantime. I um, had the opportunity to attend a program last week that was about crisis management PR during uh, crisis management, which obviously runs in parallel to the, the legal response to something. And the point that the, the um, speaker made repeatedly and very well was it's the, an organization's ability to weather that storm is all about what they do during peacetime. If you're waiting until the crisis has already happened and then you start to have these conversations, you're virtually doomed at that point. Not only has the harm, harmful ac action already happened, but your ability to respond to that in a healthy way is, is you know, way beyond you. Um, a question, the, the question for you is, you know, if there is something that happens, particularly in a larger organization, an employee who feels victimized and, and vulnerable or a volunteer may feel more comfortable going to their immediate manager versus all the way to the top of the organization with HR or CEO or a board member. Um, and that person, you know, that may be more of a mid-level manager. Do you have guidelines on what that very initial conversation should look like, how that manager, you know, what they should or shouldn't say, the, the kinds of things that the employee could ask for and how a manager should respond to those? Do you have just sort of general guidelines for that an organization could then use to create some training around that? So your question was, uh, what is it that the initial manager should say to the employee? Yes, exactly. Particularly if they're not in that um, most senior level of HR, or CEO, or you know, really in that place of being able to say, this is exactly what we're going to do in response. Maybe they don't feel like they, they are empowered with that, but they need to be responsive and, res and, and respectful to this issue. Right. Well, the organization's sexual harassment prevention policy should first of all, spell out what it is that the manager is expected to do when they receive a complaint of sexual harassment. Uh, and typically, that will be something like this, the manager must go to human resources and report it. it. It's not, the manager takes what the employee has said, and depending on the organization, the manager may, you know, may just be going directly to human resources or may take down what the employee is saying and, and then go to human resources. But essentially the manager should let the employee know that, they, that the organization takes it very seriously. Um, and, and also, you know, as I said before, the managers have to have training on sexual harassment prevention and ways in which to address it. And, what the organization's policies are and what is expected of the supervisor. But certainly the supervisor should let that employee know that they take it very seriously, that 
the manager is going to follow whatever the protocols are in the in the in the policy whether it's going to human resources or going to the CEO but the manager is responsible for um, taking that information and reporting it to make sure that it's addressed uh, the manager should also follow up with that employee after it's been uh, brought to human resources by the manager or brought to whomever is the the person set forth in the policy that the manager is supposed to go to. The manager should follow up with the employee to check in with them on how they're doing. It may be a situation where the employee needs to be, or the person who's accused needs to be separated from the employee. And so th that may be something that the manager is would be discussing with human resources or whomever they're supposed to report to about what interim steps need to be made. But it's really, really important that managers check in with their employees who have made these complaints to make sure that the employee feels safe, to make sure that the employee knows that the matter is being addressed, and that either human resources or that manager will let that employee know what the status is of the investigation. Uh, it may be human resources that does that, um, but it's just very important that the manager is is checking in with the employee so the employee knows that the organization cares about them and takes the matter seriously. And also that the employee should be informed that the organization prohibits retaliation. And if the employee believes for any reason that he or she has been retaliated against for making the complaint that they should notify that manager or human resources immediately. Thank you for reinforcing those points and the, the follow-up, the safety um, re affirmation. Um, one question here, has the, how has Me Too changed legislation and are there new bills or laws, um, particularly at the state or local level that you're tracking that nonprofits should know about? Well, I mean, it's had a, it's had a significant um, impact. New York State passed a, a series of laws on the topic of sexual harassment following the whole hashtag Me Too, uh, involving um, just a wide variety, a wide variety of, of changes, including expanding coverage to independent contractors who, um, who can, you know, who can make claims of sexual harassment, to having in New York um, certain restrictions in, in settlements of sexual harassment, uh, as to confidentiality, where confidentiality has to be the complainant's preference, and the complainant has to be given 21 days to consider whether or not to agree to the confidentiality agreement, and then seven days to revoke it. And there's just been a wide variety of changes, pro a prohibition on mandatory arbitration of sexual harassment claims. Uh, and in New York, there's mandatory training now, annually for all employees, regardless of the size of the employer. And that applies to not, everything I'm telling you applies to nonprofit organizations. So uh, in, there has to be a, a sexual harassment policy that complies with the state's requirements. If uh, an employer is in New York City and has 15 or more employees, there are certain requirements with respect to uh, what needs to be in the training of employees, sexual harassment prevention training of employees, uh, and other states, um, I believe in jurisdictions, some of them have also followed suit by, by uh, implementing um, some similar restrictions as well and, and, and enhancements to, to the law to, to, prevent, uh, to prevent sexual harassment. Uh, now that there's really a heightened awareness, more employees are coming forward and are aware of their rights, and these mandatory policies and trainings will probably, you know, continue to make it that employees feel more comfortable in in coming forward. And so, um, just a number of jurisdictions have, you know, have really um, tried to enhance. Uh, protections for not just employees but independent contractors in in uh, in their rights in preventing um, uh, in preventing uh, sexual harassment and 
we know that you know certain uh, at certain government levels, you know, some have looked at the issue of whether volunteers should be encompassed in that. That hasn't happened yet in New York City, but or hasn't happened. But you know, it's 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 something that um, municipalities may be looking at as well: the expansion of of laws prohibiting sexual harassment. So organizations that had policies in place several years ago can't just assume that that they are good continuing with that, that they really need to go back and ensure that they are staying current with, with new compliance requirements and expectations. And uh, absolutely. Absolutely. They, they really need to know in the jurisdiction that they're in, whether there have been recent developments as there have been in New York that will, I, you know, in New York, employers, all of them had to. Uh, update their policies because New York State required certain certain uh, provisions and language to be included in those policies uh, and and mandated training. And so employers, regardless of nonprofits, regardless of the jurisdiction that they're in, even if it's outside New York, uh, should be looking at have there been recent developments in my jurisdiction. Uh, because it's quite likely that if they have not updated their sexual harassment policy in a few years, uh, that they're going to need to do that. Uh, and training, even if it's not mandated in their state or jurisdiction, is always a good idea to do regular training for their managers and employees on the laws prohibiting sexual harassment and what type of behavior that an organization expects in the workplace. So those are, those are some I think that is the perfect point to end on. Um, it, it really summarizes uh, the entire hour here. So Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you to our attendees um, for being here. We will send out a recording of this or a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. Um, Lisa, again, really appreciate what, what you brought today and what you and Perlman and Perlman are doing for our, um, for our sector and our space. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay.